Welcome to the Witness Underground podcast. Today we have Valentine Reedman. He's an incredible musician and also has a background associated with the Jehovah's Witnesses, including going all the way to Ecuador in a kind of missionary fashion. We'll learn about that. And he's also directly tied to everyone in the film, the Witness Underground documentary, and even some of his songs made it into the documentary soundtrack. So thank you, Valentine, for coming to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's yeah, it'll be fun. <laughs> you deny or agree with my introduction? And <laughs> add any more information? I forgot. I can agree for the most part. I'm not really friends with anybody anymore, but um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we're right. still friends, and uh, from everybody in the movie, and I actually just got to see everybody basically all together. Um, Danny's going away party to California, so. Um, Eric and Cindy played a show and, you know, Ryan was there doing pictures and all that stuff. And it was, it was really awesome. So, yeah. So for the audience, Ryan is maybe his story would be the backbone of witness underground and sort of the logical story arc, the leaving the religion arc. And then Cindy, Eric and Cindy Elvendahl, Cindy's the kind of emotional arc where she's sort of like just kind of getting into the music scene has she's like the emotional arc of the film and then she becomes like a rock goddess sort of like an interesting you have like ryan's logical demise and then landing and then cindy's like emotional like i'm a rock goddess yep and then high tv celebration and then danny is in cindy's band that came after high tv far out Correct. and so danny just had a going away party danny's moving to los angeles i believe yep is that right yep she's yeah. there right now so yeah. very cool yeah I actually met Danny for the first time at the Witness Underground screening at our final film festival screening in Los Angeles. Yep. So she was like checking out Los Angeles. So it's cool to see a little bit later down the road. She's like making it happen. Yep. Yep. She just signed the lease on her apartment and everything. So she's like there and like ready to move in. And so, yeah, it's pretty, pretty Very exciting cool. for her. For sure. Yeah. And she has a podcast and you've been she on has. that podcast, haven't you? I have been on that podcast. Yeah. So hopefully I don't rehash too much or anything. Oh, <laughs> the internet loves that. <laughs> what is your association? I guess in brief, we don't have to get super deep into the religious aspect, but we can, um, give us your background with the religion. So I was born in Colorado, which is where my parents met. Uh, my mom was brought up as a witness, N never got baptized. And so actually when she moved out, she was not a practicing witness met my dad who was never a witness and uh uh i guess i don't know if they ever had any plans on becoming jehovah's witnesses um but then they came to the door and um my mom wanted to see what my dad would do and uh <laughs> sent him to the door and he accepted the literature and so she was like oh okay he might be interested and maybe he was uh, on his best behavior because she was there. Or yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> then, be nice to those Christians. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, I don't know if he even knew that she had previously been involved with Jehovah's Witnesses or not. I don't. I don't know that, but I just know that the very the story is that the very next day, the Mormons came and my dad also took their literature. So my dad was Hilarious. maybe just more <laughs> looking for some sort of you know direction in his life. Okay. Yeah, so I was two years old, I think, when they became witnesses and then grew up in it. That's pretty much my beginnings in being a Jehovah's okay. Witness and was always encouraged to go further, for sure. How old were you in Colorado before you guys left Colorado as a uh, family? Uh, we left when I was 13. So, yep. Okay. yep. So by that time, I was a publisher and all that stuff. And publisher means you're going door to door. Yep. Officially. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Like grooming you to be a cult member. <laughs> <laughs> and like um, most of them, I wasn't very good at going door to door. So, <laughs> yeah. so at that point, your parents decided to go to Ecuador. How did that all work out? They had a friend and I guess it was a family friend that, you know, a couple that had been in our congregation there in Colorado and they moved to Ecuador. And then we kept hearing all these stories about how nice it is and how fun and interesting. And so my parents, uh, sold their house in Colorado and packed us up and we all went and like sight unseen. We, none of us, like, it's not even like my parents went down there to like test it and see if it would maybe be a good fit for us. They just sold everything and, you know, we loaded up as much stuff as we could and just went and, um, 
got there and the culture shock was real for sure for most of us. <laughs> I think maybe my youngest brother was maybe the only one who didn't need to adjust to it because he was so young. So uh, he was probably uh, five. There's a couple levels of why people would decide to do something like that. I know for me, it was some part of it. Was, it was like two different parts of me. I, I went to Ecuador as a Jehovah's Witness after you and I were kind of partying a lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> in Minneapolis. I consider the Minneapolis experience for those few years I was there as sort of like my college experience. Yeah. Yeah. Like the I kind of interesting people I was meeting, the new relationships I was having, the, I don't know, belligerent partying. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, I feel like there were lots of blackout drunk nights or just like hedonistically drinking too much nights in general. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I look sure. back on most of that time with fondness, but it's kind of yeah. funny to think that after that, I was like, well, I'm going to go serve the God, true God of the universe <laughs> in another country as a representative. <laughs> I was like, left a religion in months after that, like <laughs> within the year. Yeah. Um, but for me, it was sort of like one last ditch effort to do something holy. Sure. But also skeptically. And I kind of just wanted to have an adventure. Like the, hu like the human side of me was like, yeah, I want to have an adventure. And then some part of me was like, well, I want to save face in the faith mm -hmm. by doing the adventuring within this bizarre religious framework because then I get to keep my family or maintain some kind of illusion of my belief system or something. <laughs> so do you think your parents had any kind of like dual level of like, well, we never had to have an adventure or something because we they had kids when they were 20 or something like mm -hmm. that? Or what do you think was going on for them? That was probably a lot of it. Um, I remember when we were younger too, my parents having like marital like problems. I remember the elders coming over and counseling them and things like that. And I, I wonder if in some ways this felt like, um, you know, a way to rejuvenate their marriage also. Mm. Um, like having kids. Yeah, exactly. And like, Our marriage is going terribly. Let's have babies. Yeah. And after the last kid, I think my dad, you know, got a vasectomy so that like they couldn't do that again. And so, <laughs> um, so it was kind of like, marriage is problematic. let's yeah. take it across the world to where we have no support system and we have to rely on each other even more. Yeah. And, and, and I doubt that's a hundred percent what it was, but I remember during that period of time, the elders coming over a lot and having conversations and things like that. So it could have been part of it. Um, I know my parents wanted us to grow up in an environment that was different. Um, they didn't, they wanted, I guess in some ways any parent would want your kid to have a, hopefully a diverse upbringing, you know, it mm -hmm. creates a more well-rounded person, I think for the most part. And they wanted that for us. Um, but they also wanted us to be able to go somewhere where we could focus on spiritual aspect of our lives. And, um, you know, the preaching work was easier there in some ways, you know, you got a, a better response from people, I think. And so I think they thought that yeah. that would be encouraging to us as well. So what, how old or what years are we talking? Uh, 1997. Um, and then we left in 2000. So. Okay. So a few years, but pretty mm -hmm. important formative years. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Years. Yeah. I ended up going to, you know, 10th grade high school in Ecuador, you know? So like, um, it, it was very formative. I'd never seen poverty in my life. I, I thought I had, and, and then I, you know, to live within it and to have friends that were suddenly that poor and to, and to still be happy people was kind of encouraging and it's definitely left a mark no matter what whether we went down there to be Jehovah's Witnesses or we went down there to be banana barons or something you know we would <laughs> you know the experience is still um, huge but whether you want to be what is it or a colonial a cultural colonialist or a financial farming colonialist <laughs> those are the two options yeah yeah those are the two for sure <laughs> How, I mean, that must have been like pretty shocking to be dropped into another completely different language group mm -hmm. and culture. Like, does there, do you remember what it felt like as a 13 year old to be just all of a sudden immersed like that? Yeah, I, I think I had the best handle on Spanish at that point. I had just finished mm -hmm. uh, seventh grade Spanish. And so I had, 
a small amount of conversational Spanish that I could do. My mom is um, half Mexican, so mm -hmm. she, um, but she grew up in a household where her dad didn't really speak Spanish around them, and so she didn't really speak at all. But oh, wow. um, but that's about as far as the the Spanish went. Um, so yeah, I remember See it being shocking. Yeah, and I, I remember being at the airport and having to attempt to explain some of the things in our luggage that we were bringing in because my parents had no idea what to expect. And so we brought everything they could think of. We had 11 trunks, like 70 pound trunks, just <laughs> loaded with stuff. And and this is obviously before 9-11, you could do a lot more stuff and put a lot more stuff on a plane. And so they they brought like a little television set, like a maybe a <laughs> not even a 10 inch television set with a built in VCR because they were like, they might not have this technology and we better have something to watch down there. Got to watch like purple triangles Hilarious. while we're there. And um, uh, that's a Jehovah's Witness movie about yeah. the Nazis. <laughs> Basically, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, um, that's okay. No, I'm just trying to like keep it. No, I'm I'm glad publicly you, relevant. Yep, yeah. that's um, hilarious. Though. It's something I tell people a lot that have never traveled, and I don't mm -hmm. meet people like that too often anymore. But there has been, I've met enough people that know that people think like that, and they're like, well, a lot of these things you can't get anywhere else in the world because we're from America. Yeah, and America is the only place with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and like a lot of like, what if I run out of toothpaste? Like, you know, like the whole rest of the planet also has toothpaste. You can just buy that when you get there. <laughs> You don't need to like stockpile it or like bring cases of toilet paper. Like yeah. the whole planet's pretty similar. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Including VHSs and televisions. Exactly. They did have those. Exactly. <laughs> but I remember having to be at the airport explaining what things were. And, and that was a big leap because I knew very small amounts of Spanish. And it was just like trying to explain like this is a television set. And this is – and not like they didn't know, but they were like, why are you bringing this into the country? And I think a lot of that stuff probably has – taxes on it of some sort but uh, we were able to get through the airport and then we went to the to the branch the jehovah's witnesses witnesses branch there in um guayaquil ecuador mm -hmm. and um we were there for a couple days they kind of set us up with some ground rules certain things to be aware of um the, at the time there was a issue with strawberries they told us to stay away from strawberries because there was a you you could eat it and then there was like a larva or something that lived in there that would like get into your brain and kill you so they were like Whoa. yeah and so there's this gnarly <laughs> thing going around and they're just I like, should have talked to them yeah <laughs> just eating strawberries like crazy <laughs> yeah. yeah that explains all kinds of things yeah okay. yeah so we got our our rules you know just be careful of certain things and then we were just basically on a bus i think we were there for 2 days at the branch something like that and we got on a bus with all of our stuff and you know five hours later we were in the middle of this tiny little town in the mountains and standing on the side of the road waiting for this contact brother that was supposed to come and meet us and it was incredibly shocking it, um, it was weird it was very weird because you went from kind of being excited about an adventure but um, now you're trusting people on the other side of the yeah, planet. Exactly. Yeah. You're trusting people you've never met to come and show up and be there and bring you to your apartment. Um, my parents had already rented an apartment, gotten it already, and so it was. What town was it in, or what was the nearby city? It was uh, San Miguel um, de Bolivar. Um, de Bolivar. So it's uh, Waranda would be the capital of Bolivar. Um, mm. It's kind of, um, it's like five hours, I would say five hours east of Guayaquil. So more towards Cuenca? Yeah, it would be north of Cuenca still, but um, okay. yep, yep. I never really got that far down. I spent most of my time in Manabí, which is like the southwest or central west near Manta, and then up in Quito and Bancos and then Tena, like just kind of central, but <laughs> southwest or central west. Mm-hmm near Manta and then oh yeah up. okay cool yeah Puyo and Tena yeah did you know the Irish family that are witnesses who did whitewater rafting yeah they were like okay. our homies like the dents cool. 
that's right. <laughs> People used to say that they can read river or they speak river or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they can. Like, like I guess anyone who knows how to whitewater raft would also be able to do that. But they they were the only ones who could do that. <laughs> but that was fun. I went with them yeah. after, like actually after I was not a witness anymore. I was like, this. I actually went there with my. Um, then girlfriend who's also an ex-witness mm. but I was like I know everyone in this country who's interesting and fun <laughs> and adventurous it's so like now that we're here let's just pretend we're still witnesses yeah yeah <laughs> because I have I can make all these things happen like that if yeah. I do so, so we went whitewater rafting with the dents it was great I had a great time and then the dad the father dent like flew off the raft on the same rock that yeah. I also flew off the raft so it's like warm feeling thinking about this Irish whitewater rafting yeah. Jehovah's Witness yeah. in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> they are they are the best. They are super friendly, super fun. Um, yeah. Growing up around them was really really cool. Um, I have a funny story, and you can cut it out if you want. But oh, um, Eleanor Dent, um, we were over at their house, and you know, as kids, you know, we're just like you know talking shit about something, and we keep saying crap, and she's like, "Why do you boys keep saying crap?" in my house and we're like what what are we supposed she's like that's a swear word don't say crap and we were kind of like well what would you rather us say and she said i don't know say fuck or shit or something like that (laughs) we're like like, crap was really hard edged crap (laughs) crap was bad for her and and but fucking shit was like you know totally normal (laughs) that's really funny we were like that's europeans for you yeah exactly and they were just like Braveheart's their favorite movie and you know all this stuff like they were watching violent. stuff that was way Rated more violent movies. than we would watch at home and they were like cream of the crap <laughs> apparently there's all different I mean every country or every region of the world has their own lines like yeah. for example like the big issue in Malawi was that people were going to prison as like basically martyrs for the religion because they couldn't buy a 50 cent political card because that would be like against God's thing but in Mexico you could bribe someone 20 bucks for the exact same thing and, and it was like I don't know that was double standards right or like in Europe you can have a beard but in the States yeah. it's like you're obviously a, like a Satan worshiper if you have a beard in the United yeah. States yeah definitely like why I think it's the same way in like the Caribbean and stuff like beards and stuff like that are okay um, but for some reason in the United States and probably other places yeah the facial hair is scary it's so bizarre yeah yeah um you, you brought when you said your family got dropped off on the side of the road and you're just like waiting around for your like contact person mm-hmm. it sounds partially i have a whole vision immediately of being in like rio bamba or Ombato, like on yeah. the side of the volcano alley yeah it's one of those high mountain places and it's like you're there's a lot of people living in that region but there's not a lot happening and you could be on the hi- middle of the highway or on the highway f- and it would just feel like you're isolated from from the whole world. Yep. Um, and people were on horses yep. and indigenous Quechua people walking around wearing traditional outfits that they handmade. Yep. Like it's a whole other world you're sort of dropped into. Yeah, that's definitely, that's exactly it. Like Rio Bamba is a good example. Um, just scaled down even smaller to San Miguel. I don't even know the population of San Miguel, but, um, it was very small and we were just dropped off on this one corner that you're just like, there's nobody and you're just sitting there and like, <laughs> you're like, Lonely, I don't it's wild. It's high altitude. Right. Yeah. And there's a little bit of paranoia. Like, you know, you don't know, like, you know, you've heard like certain horror stories from the guys at the branch about, you know, pickpockets and thieves and, you know, things like that. And so you're a little on edge. You're like unsure what's happening. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and but, if you ever watch any American propaganda films oh, sure. about the police, yeah, um, the whole 1970s through the 90s movies were about like white guys being dropped into Latin American countries, yep. where all the people are like after you, yep. if they have, and they have guns and knives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so and I can I- imagine that playing a role in your mind too. Like, where? Wait, what did we decide to do? We're just like out here now, <laughs> exposed, waiting around. Yeah, definitely. It was. You can only trust one person. <laughs> yep. Yep. It, it was that way too. And it, it turns out it was not that way at all. You know, once you lived there and you got into it and you realized that like they love Americans, like they didn't have an issue with us and they also didn't view us as easy targets. We, we were never, we never had issues with it, but um, that's cool. Yeah. By contrast, I went to Ecuador because I'd met 
I like moved to Florida right after we knew each other in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of just like a stopping point for a minute to do some work with my brother's company. And I wanted to go to Latin America or South America because I've been learning Spanish slowly. And that was like my, I just I really wanted to go abroad and I knew that there was a path there. And I met this guy doing some stupid Jehovah's Witness job, like the tile floor, stupid vacuuming and wiping maintenance oh, job. Oh, yeah. What do you call that? Uh, like Set3 was the company. Yeah. I worked for the a similar yeah. company in Minneapolis. Um, right. Yeah. They called it uh, high risk maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> we were janitors. <laughs> yeah. That's what it was. We're like janitors and like data centers. Yep. So, Correct. Like, our equipment was a mop. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they took themselves so seriously. Yeah. So Anti static like, vacuum cleaners. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm a maintenance professional or no. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, the data center professional. It's like, pretty sure you're a janitor. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, anyway, so I met some guy that was doing that, and he was like, "Yeah, I'm a missionary in Ecuador, and you should come down. I'm just here to make two months worth of money, and that's enough to live there for like a year." Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, that's crazy. Uh, he's like, "Yeah, come down. We're, we actually have a lot of surfers that live in our couple of villages down the coast, and we have all these secret surf spots." And I was like, "All right, that's the coolest thing I've heard yet." <laughs> so I ended up going straight after getting to the, the country. I went to like one of the Jehovah's Witness assemblies and then went all the way to the coast on like an eight hour bus. It's like you go, I don't know, wherever that place you were talking about, like the branch building or whatever. Oh, uh, Some assembly yeah. thing yeah. near Guayaquil. And then yeah. it was like four or five hours up the coast mm -hmm. in Manabi. And there was like some party that was happening. And I got there a day early for a party. <laughs> but like the guy invited me to come early. And then we like kayaked on a blow up kayak around a, an island in like there's like sharp volcanic rock and like <laughs> the waves go down and the rocks like stuck. And I'm like, Oh my God, we're going to puncture. And then it's like, let's go farther away from this Island. We're going to die out here. It's like an hour paddle from the coast. Anyway, I met all these surfers and I infilt almost felt like it was that Keanu Reeves movie where they rob banks. All the surfers oh, rob banks. Yeah, yeah. Point break. Yep. But it was like, I wasn't infiltrating a dangerous group. I was infiltrating like in, a poorly educated mind control cult mm -hmm. victim group <laughs> yeah. of surfers who yeah. had like found a way to make the cult tolerable by becoming surfers. You were the bank country. robber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The opposite. Like me with all my scary thought crime ideas <laughs> rolling through my head. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and I did the terrible, terrible thing of like only preaching for 20 hours a month instead of the typical 70 you're supposed to do. Yeah. Anyway, that's bad. Infiltrated the surfer crew. <laughs> and it was actually amazing. Like, I learned to surf in this wild, not a fishing village of like 2,000 people or something. Yeah. Yeah. I have very, like, I, it was a good experience as like a young 20 something to like yeah. be dropped into like a fun environment like that. What was the, what was the little town that you were at? Um, Puerto Cayo. Okay. And think, then there was, was there a Cologne? Puerto Lopez is also. Okay. Like the major, more major, like whale watching, okay. seafaring tourist town. Okay, nearby. I think I think I was in a place called Cologne, maybe, um, okay. which is kind of in that general direction. Um, but I don't. I'm not sure. I, I I could be wrong. I might be misremembering. But I mean, there were Jehovah's Witnesses scattered everywhere. So if that's like your only way to what do they call that in video games? So like the fog of war. Oh you yeah. Like go through the black and it get revealed. <laughs> Like I only know of places where Jehovah's Witnesses live through yeah. Ecuador. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We stayed with a couple after an assembly one time, and they were like, "Oh, you should come up, and like we can, you know, take you guys boogie boarding, and maybe teach you how to surf." And like two days in, I stepped on a stingray, and like, <laughs> you know, how was that? It was all right, not bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Would do again? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> it. I think I was very lucky because the other story that they told us was another brother who was there got it through his calf muscle um and had to come to shore with the stingray hanging off of his calf muscle Oof. and and whereas with me i stepped basically on this the the stinger part and it went into my big toe and just hit my bone and stopped so it didn't go through it just kind of went boop and, and then i was done my leg swole up swelled up and you know i was done for the day and freaked out that i was gonna lose my leg but you know kids are you know babies 
So yeah, you're a teenager, huh? Yeah, I was. A so all this is thirteen to what? Seventeen, thirteen to eight. Thirteen to uh, what month did we move? We might have moved when I was still sixteen. It might have been previous to when I, because I think I turned thirteen when we were there. I think thirteen to sixteen. So yeah. Okay. So interesting. And then you went back to Minneapolis after that. No, we actually moved uh, briefly back to Colorado and lived with my uncle. And then my dad had this great idea to move to uh, basically Corpus Christi, Texas. And so we moved to Texas for about a year. And then what was there? Um, my dad had heard that there was good. Um, there was like a big need for like uh, he, he does like construction and stuff like that. So he thought there was a big need for that. And there was like, he started his own business there and like, you know, it was fine and it was a great place to live. We were a couple blocks from the beach and, um, kind of maintain that still kind of like free lifestyle a little bit. I mean, although I'd never been to a place as racist as Texas, I'm not saying that for all of Texas, but the part of Texas that I was in, um, was in really weird to be exposed to like children my age and the way that they talked about people and there were Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, it was really strange. I also had never seen the kind of poverty that I had seen there in the United States. Like that was my first like United States poverty that I had seen. So hmm. it was still like a learning experience and I had a lot of fun and I still have friends from there. But um, hmm. my dad sensed we were starting to get in trouble more, which is the same reason we left Ecuador is us boys were kind of getting ourselves into trouble <laughs> certain things are too easy to do in ecuador so you just do them um <laughs> give me an example uh when we first moved there once my parents got comfortable they used to send us to the store and they would send us with the reusable beer bottles and tell us to go get them beer and then give us money and or get them a box of wine we get them a box of wine and it dawned on us after a few times that we could just, and they would just sell it to us. You know, I was 13, my brother was 11 <laughs> and they would sell us the beer and the wine. And so it, we caught on that we could actually just buy it for ourselves. And <laughs> that's what we did. <laughs> um, Sounds fun. Yeah. And so you kind of started getting into that stuff, you know, the bad association thing, you know, you're kind of around, you know, other kind of Westerner witnesses who are used to getting away with a lot of things. And so you start getting into the habit of doing that kind of stuff too. We weren't like bad kids towards our parents, but we, you know, rebelled in those ways for sure. Sure. Um, yeah. It's funny that the line that witnesses draw is so strict mm -hmm. compared to what most kids would, would be doing and getting away with when they're 16, 17, 18. Yeah. Like, for sure. It's like, oh my God, you watched that movie? You're not allowed to watch that kind of movie. <laughs> like, you're punished. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you drank a beer. Yeah. You're, this is, we have to move to another country. <laughs> yeah. It, it was getting to be that way. Yes, for sure. So you're not stealing cars. You're not breaking windows of the local Starbucks because <laughs> you're angsty and you hate capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. You didn't uh, get anyone pregnant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It was totally like easy, small town stuff. You know, it wasn't like really getting into trouble. Um, yeah. But I think part of it was my parents were seeing that what they, one of their goals of exposing us to this like more fertile um, place of preaching and being a witness wasn't really working to make us into like super obedient, really good witnesses. And so I think that was part of it too. Like, well, we, if you guys are going to do this, we might as well just go back to the States. And, um, mm. you know, I was 15 years old when I first mentioned to my mom that I, I think I might believe in reincarnation. And she was like, what? And, and I was like, I just, it doesn't, otherwise it doesn't make sense to me. Like to, at the, that point, reincarnation made so much sense that I just had to tell my mom that I'm like, I, I think I believe in it. And like, how could my energy cease to be and without like either going into somebody else or being reborn into something else. And, mm -hmm. and which is weird because I'd never even really been exposed maybe to the idea of reincarnation much outside of what the witnesses would tell you it is, Yeah, you know, for your own preaching purposes, maybe. Um, so yeah, that was like, 
15 was probably when I was getting doubts and I'd bring those to my mom and it was usually like, oh, well, you know, trying to talk you through it, I guess, things. But, um, you know. And what, what about the idea of like your soul or spirit or consciousness returning to a source? So the reincarnation is like you're an independent mm-hmm. being, right? Mm-hmm. And that like get, moves into another creature or yeah. another body. Yeah. That's one that seems to be like talked a lot about right now in my life, or at least like oh. the circles I'm like getting information from. Yeah. I don't know that I agree with that. It's just like an interesting concept. Did that come to your mind at all? Do you remember? I, so I remember a very specific thing. Um, I had had a dream about myself dying and that in my dream, I could see the viewpoint of the people, like other people in the hall, like looking at me. And because in my dream, I was like, but I can see what they're seeing still. And so for me, I felt like that dream, I started thinking about it more about like my energy, not ceasing to exist basically. And that it just kind of either becomes a part of somebody else's or it became a new thing. Um, which I, I don't really, it's not really my thing anymore. I don't really like Mm. put much attachment to it. But at the time, I think, especially when you're young and especially when you've been told you will live forever, the idea of dying is like unfathomable. And the only thing you could ever think is like, well, at least maybe my consciousness continues. Like the, Mm -hmm. the idea of that ceasing didn't make sense to me. So it makes more sense now, but <laughs> it's also strange to like when you're a kid, you also feel invincible just, just yeah. because you're so young, right? Like mm-hmm. the, you heal quickly, you bounce <laughs> back, you break a bone, it heals like you feel invincible in a way. Uh, but then all the old people that are telling you as that who are witnesses are telling you that you're going to live forever. I'm like, check out this book. It says millions of people that are now living will never die, but it was written in 1920. And you're like, <laughs> but all the people who read that died. <laughs> <laughs> the math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. That that was troubling too. Definitely later on, you know, when I was getting closer to leaving, that stuff started getting more and more troubling to me. Getting closer to the end of the generation and all those things. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it just, I, I don't know. I was told, like, you'll never get your driver's license. You'll never graduate high school you'll never do these things and so there was no preparation for those things and so the same way of like you're you're never gonna die so there's no preparation for it even as a kid there's no like solid like idea being built within yourself so you're susceptible i think in some ways to like latch on to other things um yeah it's also interesting that they don't really mourn death either yeah they don't really like it's like, yeah, okay, they're upset now, but you, know, you get a couple of weeks to be kind of in an emotional place, but the person's not really gone. Like, they're going to come back. Mm-hmm. It's like, you're never going to die, but if you do die, it's okay because, like, God's going to remember you pretty soon. And, like, everything always feels like it was, like, three to five years away in yeah. that religion. Yeah. You know, like, don't, don't plan for that. <laughs> don't plan for anything. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. But, like everyone who didn't plan for anything is now suffering because they didn't plan for anything. For sure. Even my parent, when I talked to my dad, like I had an interaction with him six years ago where I confronted him and I was like, well, this is your maybe last opportunity to have an influence on me. Like, do you have any advice for your child? Who's now an, you know, late thirties adult. He's like, save for your retirement. It's like, you didn't do that. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm giving you advice. It sucks if you don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I'll take it. So I did research it and I did start saving for my retirement. I'm really, really glad I did. Cause I learned a lot. Yeah. I've been doing <laughs> anyway. Good job. <laughs> it's such a crazy religion's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking back to like funerals, the way that it's kind of like almost a small thing for Jehovah's witnesses. Um, I remember this brother in our hall died. Um, he was an elder. I think he was the presiding overseer for a while, but like he had a really big family and, and his son was one of my friends. And it was so odd to me when the day he died and then it was the meeting that night, they all came and you know, like this poor kid is like crying 
during the whole meeting because his dad had just died that day. And instead of like any like respect for people mourning, these they were like almost like applauded for being there. Like, good job. Even through that, like you're here. And I remember as like an 18 year old being kind of sickened by it because it was like, if anybody needs to be alone right now, it's right now. Like this is like, this kid needs to be by himself and he doesn't need to be surrounded by all of us. And they, they even made mention of it in the meeting when they like announced that he had passed away. And then they said like, Oh, and, and his whole family's here tonight. And, and I think everybody was like, more like business as usual. Good job. Yeah, yeah. Drop <laughs> your money in the, the box fact that you're, on the way out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So strange. Yeah, and so it was odd. And then it's just odd going to funerals there too, where there's like a five second mention of what the person was, and then scripture song. You know, this is their moment to capture non-believers who have come in there and try to bring them into the fold. When it's like you can't just have one day for people one talk just for somebody like <laughs> right honor so. anyone but your book publishing company yeah exactly <laughs> with its anonymous authors <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. um it's all also i've been learning a lot about narcissistic abuse tactics mm -hmm. or just emotional abuse tactics in general and it's really strange well it's a very specific thing that jehovah's witnesses do they try to find out when some big life event like that happens for people in the neighborhood that they're mm. preaching. Like, oh, this person's dad's sick. Come back in two months and see if he's died. And like, okay, he died. Now we can get him with the, you know, the person that you love just died brochure. And hopefully that'll, that'll hook them because they're kind of in a low mental state, low emotional state. It's sort of, uh, it's like finding someone's vulnerabilities and then twisting them to your own ends is like an abuser's a tactic. And you're sort of waiting for that moment where you can, I don't know if grooming's the right word, but you're sort of like coercing them into being manipulated or something. Yeah. I wish I had the right terminology for it, but yeah, they no. definitely get go for people who just had someone who died. Yeah. That makes sense too. I mean, um, in some ways that's the way it is going on some of these missionary work things. It's like, um, somebody in my family, I don't, I don't remember who it was, whether it was my mom or my dad, but like talking about people who live in the United States already live in a certain type of paradise. And so they don't need Jehovah's paradise. Um, whereas people who are like having a really hard time and living in like full on poverty might, that's why they're more receptive to, um, that message, which is like, yeah. It's kind of sick because you're mm -hmm. kind of preying on a vulnerability of people. Like it's not their fault. They're poor, but you know, you're going to make them into a Jehovah's witness and then it's going to be their fault when they fuck up. Like, you know, or, or after nine 11, I remember it's not like Jehovah's witnesses were happy about nine 11, but I remember there was like this renewed vigor for going door to door and people were like, you know, it's easy now. It's like easy fishing now. Cause like, you know, people are freaked out and people are like scared and, um, yeah, it is kind of a sick thing that, you know, I don't think it's conscious. Like I remember nine 11 happening and my parents were not like, yeah, it's time to go preaching. <laughs> they were freaked out too. They were scared. Right. They were like, this is really weird and heavy, but what you do with that instead of like going and literally helping people, you know, I don't know. It just seems like a weird, weird thing to go out and do right away. But yeah, there's quite a few things we could talk about. Yeah. <laughs> but I have a list of five songs oh, okay. of yours that I wanted to maybe touch on and bring into this. Okay. I'd like to soundtrack this with your music. Um, <laughs> And just, I'll give you the, the quick list are Jealousy, President, The Lake Where the Weak Swim, Briskly, and To the Sky. But you can talk about any music you want. Oh, okay. Uh, those are the ones I took little little notes on. Okay. Um, so in Witness Underground, and we can jump back to anything about yeah. or Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm good. Okay. First, I guess, what is your, when did you first get into playing music and how, what was that for you in the religion and after? How's that played a role in your life? Uh, I started playing guitar when I was 
15, so I was in Ecuador. My parents actually bought my first guitar for me when I was in Ecuador. And uh, I saw a kid at school play Hotel California, and I was like, like music had never really struck me in a way other than just listening to it. Like I enjoy listening to music, but to see somebody like a schoolmate that I knew just suddenly playing music, I don't think I was ever around musicians as a kid. So to see somebody play Hotel California, and he doesn't even know what the words are, but he's he's singing perfect in pitch, and it was like, oh my god, like this is amazing. Um, and so I quickly had him like every day he would start teaching me stuff, and uh, so I like. The first song I learned was Come As You Are, you know, the Nirvana yeah. song. and um, So then it kind of went from there. I mean, Come As You Are is kind of like, that's where you start. And then I uh, yeah. started learning chords, you know, played Polly and certain other Nirvana songs. Um, but uh, yeah, that was like my first introduction to music. And by the time we left Ecuador, I played guitar every single day. I, I was like so hooked. Um, uh, and then, it, yeah, kept doing it. Had a kind of a band thing that I tried starting in Texas, but it was more just getting together and starting to understand how like how a bass goes with a guitar and how drums fit in and you start to hear the whole thing together. Once you're used to playing by yourself and nobody else around you plays, it's kind of hard to like even envision it, but once you start to see it, it was, then it gets even more fun, you know, you put it all together. But yeah, there's something about that time that I think witnesses gravitated more towards playing music than other activities. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like, there's like infinite things a human could do for fun or a hobby, right? But like music somehow, somehow in the 90s and early 2000s, seems like it was just a thing that witnesses did individually or together. Yeah. Something like about the culture of the time period or something. Yeah, I'm curious if that's like across the board too for like if, if music became cool or, or playing music became cool. Or, or I don't I don't even know like, but yeah, the fact that that was happening, you know, in the Twin Cities and you know in Wisconsin in your area, and in Ecuador and in all different places where people were just suddenly like realizing how interesting, uh, just playing a song is. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's what caught me. It was just amazing to me. The first time I ever like downloaded some tablature or printed out some tablature and like played it and it worked and you start yeah. to understand like the way it works and it, it's i don't know it's mm -hmm. exciting but maybe that's the thing too is like you didn't have to understand music theory or go to school for music yeah you could just get tabs on the internet for free that's people were like <laughs> putting it back out there it must have been playing some part it helped that was a big thing for me too yeah yeah I could play the intro of like 60 different, like simple songs, like Nirvana songs. Yeah. At least the intro. <laughs> and at least if you could nail that, you could just play that little thing. And then all your friends would be impress like, everybody. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so you started playing music and yeah. how did you get in touch with the Minneapolis music crew? Did you know some of those people before, or was it just your parents relocated there? Yeah, it was, it was like, we finally moved to Luck, Wisconsin. And so oh, we, where Eric's from. And that's where Luck, yep, wow. that's where Eric's from. Okay. Um, and so that's when I met him at the hall. And he was already like the cool, like the cool kid that like went to the cities every weekend and like did that stuff. And, you know, so like I actually didn't see Eric a ton, um, but we became friends quickly. We recorded a couple times in his basement. And we have some like random, like there's like a surfer song out there that we did. And it's, it's pretty funny. But, um, yeah, we would like, and then we would get obsessed with that. He would have us come over. His mom would like, she was like the most accommodating person ever. Like she knew he wanted to do band stuff. She would like leave for the weekend. And so all of us boys would come over and we would just like bring all of our instruments and we would just make the strongest coffee we could make and just drink coffee all night <laughs> and just like play and just play as long as we could. And then when we couldn't do that anymore, we'd go up and get more coffee and then just like dive into like Eric's favorite movies and it was like it, we got you I have to show you this movie and this movie like have you ever seen Royal Tenenbaums have you ever seen this and, and so you're like it was a, a cultural explosion in certain ways because like these are movies I'd never heard of before and you know he's like kept you up to date on 20 years of culture like yeah. 10 years of culture or something yeah, and he's still doing that. He's still like, yeah. uh, have you watched this David Lynch movie or this? And I'm like, no. And he's like, well, you're come on, let's go. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, he's he's a big advocate for like being like, I got to show you this, and not out of like, what? I can't believe you haven't seen it. 
it's like he wants to share i'm excited to show this to you and watch it with you Um, cool so yeah and so that's how i met eric and then um we started doing a lot more music stuff and that's really when eric's like day trip and um maybe a little bit before pop riveter but he was doing day trip for sure Mm -hmm. um and so like we were going to his shows and we got obsessed with like that shoegaze sound too of course Mm -hmm. because you're just watching your friends do it and so we started putting together our own little shoegazy stuff and attempted anyway we weren't very good and yeah the recordings Who's can show we that. at that point uh, Eric or something no it, my brother and i um and um levi talmage who he actually sent mm-hmm. you a lot of the pictures yeah. for for the movie um and our friend Andy. he also generously supported the project in may no april for the screenings that we were doing every every week Oh, he, he funded that. Yeah. What? Yeah. Levi. Yeah. He's, he's been in touch. He's such a sweetie. I love him. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually never met him and I, I would love to. Yeah. He's so fantastic. If you hear this, Levi, get in touch. <laughs> Levi's been a big supporter of the Witness Underground project for a long time. Yeah. Including the footage. Like that was a huge gift too, just to get a bunch of content I could use in the film. Yeah. Yeah. When I found out that you were Photos. doing the film, I like, I was like, I know Levi has a lot of pictures yeah. and I contacted him and he was just like, Oh yeah, I'll send it all over. And I was like, so cool. Done. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that time's so interesting. Cause that, that's the same exact couple of years where I was in my like high school band. We called, mm. we were called the clones and we did an album and we started playing bars out. And then I was like half assing, but kind of taking Jehovah's Witnesses seriously. Cause I like had a new set of rules I could follow, which were like, I could do whatever I want. <laughs> and my and I don't know. It's pretty good. I didn't have to follow all the rules, and I could still maintain my relationships. So mm-hmm. that I, then I was like, well, I'm gonna quit this band because it's sort of like the witnesses don't really want me to do that. But I'm also kind of bored by the music. But I also want to make my own music. And then those guys helped me record my album. And then I like enlisted Jehovah's Witness artists I was finding that I was meeting because like that year when I was like 19, 20. I was like, do you guys want to play? This is my music. Do you want to be my like bassist, my drummer? my drummer? And that happened. And then we started playing my music to like graduation parties and stuff. And then I met this whole crew mm-hmm. uh, in Minneapolis with you guys. Mm-hmm. But it's like a vibrant thing was happening in my life. And I was like, there's a whole community of people doing the same vibrant thing. That's so cool. Yeah. I was surprised. Yeah, for sure. The way that you describe it, even in the movie, um, uh, I guess maybe it's not even described. It's just kind of shown but it felt like like these coffee shops that the witnesses would just like invade and like come and play mm-hmm. the shows and like all these people would show up that's really what it felt like as soon as you found out like Cindy was playing a show somewhere or Day Trip was playing a show it's like everybody just went and like yeah it was like so exciting to be around especially like since it was such a broad variety of people who were there i mean you have small town kids and you have city kids and you have and and you know, as a small town kid at the time, I was like so impressed with like these city kids and how like loving they were with each other and how they would hug each other and how, you know, it wasn't something that I was used to from where I was. Um, and so that really rubbed off on me too. And then you just really wanted to be a part of what they were doing because they seemed so welcoming and friendly and, you know, yeah. weren't afraid to like show affection to each other. And it, it, that was like very healthy for a young man to see for sure so there's a i was doing some kind of post film being out research on some of the other characters who are still in the religion from that scene at that time Mm. who have since put up stuff with even maybe you in it like a year or two after i left minneapolis so i don't even know if who was in the religion or not at that point, but whoever was still in the religion was doing like music weekend away at like an Airbnb type thing. Oh, okay. didn't have that back then, but it was, you guys had a cabin making music and, and sledding, (laughs) like the most wholesome thing ever. Yeah. Um, But there's like some October Ridge video that someone took with uh, Hiromi and some poet guy. I can't remember his name at the moment. And like just doing like shoulder cam, videos of people like interviewing them and they would talk to the camera or like say something about what was happening in that moment and it's funny because they're like everyone's 20 or 23 years old and like it was amazing to kind of go back there because 
it's like exactly the time period when I met everyone in that community. Mm -hmm. And I felt there was like these, everyone's like a bigger, like larger than life character. And they all have their own like clothing style and like everyone's, you know, just <laughs> being personalities. And there was like some pretentiousness about it and goofiness about it. And well, someone was pretending that they were on acid for some reason. But like, of course, no one's ever done any drugs. But like, what has happened? It was so funny and like nostalgic to go watch that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's odd. <laughs> Overall, a pretty vibrant community. Yeah. Very, yeah. very vibrant. Yeah. And it's kind of true, too, from the movie, like when you would... um where Chad would talk about him, like, yeah, I'm in day trip and like kids coming up to him at the assembly <laughs> and stuff. I like, I was probably one of those kids. Cause like, I kind of like, wasn't really close with Chad at the time yet until we were like basically in the same congregation and stuff. But like, you know, like seeing people like that was like minor celebrities and you're, you get excited and you're like, look at that guy. Oh man, look at that cool, like sweater he's wearing, <laughs> you know, kind of <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> We all had cool thrift store sweaters. <laughs> exactly. Like you had to start looking like everybody else. All right, it's time to go to the Goodwill. Like, you know, you gotta be thrifty right. and <laughs> cool looking. <laughs> Get a Conor burst look. Yeah, exactly. On us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny different times yep <laughs> um so of all the songs on your two albums you have i we i mentioned you on the gw thoughts channel oh, with yeah. wally barnett yeah, which i watched so his, yeah. you, your links are on there for blue skies yeah um and so i've got this you got your sound click songs and there's seven songs on there i get the impression that like you made all those as singles they weren't like yeah a body of work or an EP. Is that Correct. right? Yeah. yeah. The majority of those were like, other than the briskly song with Eric, um, the majority of those songs were done basically in my parents' basement on a tape cassette, like recorder. You're in personal studio is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what it was. <laughs> but I used to like, like songs like jealousy. That song is like, yeah. I recorded that on a cassette and then I really plugged it into my computer at the time and then recorded it onto the computer and then I played it in reverse and then I played the guitar one more time over the top. So that's why it's kind of like, bing, bing, you know, um, it's cool, but it's the one that ended up in the soundtrack for Witness Underground. Yeah. I love that song. Yeah. I, I love that song too. And I love it because, um, I didn't know what I was doing recording. Like, it's not like I had, that was one of my first songs that I ever recorded. Um, and it was like the process of figuring it out was like so fun. Um, and I, and I, and I liked recording like that. And I've actually told Tasha, my wife, Tasha, that recently was that like, I want to get back to recording, but I want it to feel still really like raw and like unfinished in a way, you know, I want it to feel like a challenge to do it. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that, that, those songs from my sound click are a lot like that. They're just very, early so yeah there's another one it's called to the sky oh yeah and i have this feeling i've thought this before and i just wrote it down today <laughs> when i was going over your music again because i like i tried to include like all of these songs in the soundtrack <laughs> at different points of my three month soundtracking like emotional yeah. experience i went through because i want to get them it's like so important to me and i keep telling people like that's probably my i wouldn't say it's my biggest creative contribution to the film but it's like the most difficult piece that i feel like i nailed it and yeah. but it was really really hard and like a crazy emotional journey personally to use your or like the community's music to mm -hmm. tell this community story mm -hmm. um in a way that i felt like not just wasn't just there because you guys made the song so it fits it's like no it emotionally feels right for the theme even if it's not the person talking who made the song but like the emotions fit the story and the vibe of that speaker at that moment um to the sky did not make that cut <laughs> <laughs> but it has this <laughs> jealousy made the cut and so did briskly um but to the sky has this funny thing to me and you can tell me what you think of this but it feels mm -hmm. like almost okay i'm gonna describe this idea okay in the 1960s they made futuristic looking cars like the jetsons yeah or they made like futuristic furniture like we are future people, right? So felt, like now, but now you look at designs that come from the 1960s and you're like, oh, it looks so 1960s. But for them, it was like, we are in the future now, right? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so I have this vibe from To the Sky that's like 90s futuristic. Yeah. Where it has these like blips and beeps and like dee doo dee dee doo doo. Like these like telephone beep sounds mm-hmm. and these like scratches and like fading in and out tones. It somehow it feels like we're in a robot simulation from an, like in an AI future, but it's like now it feels like the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I'm. I want to go with that for sure. I think it was more I had an upset, like a very early obsession with Aphex Twin, and I didn't know mm. how to make his music, and I didn't understand, like what he was doing even. Um, yeah, and so it was like I love Aphex Twin. Yeah, it was trying to like Window Liquor EP was oh, amazing. That's like the best one. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> Levi will probably uh, disagree, but um, he's <laughs> well, like he he's did, huge like... Aphex Twin fan. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Then what came before that was like the night it's like nineteen eighty five to nineteen eighty nine, like mm-hmm. two album forty song set <laughs> of like weird shit, right? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I listen to it actually pretty regularly, like comes up a, a couple times a year for me and I'm like, it's still so weird. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't yeah. quite ever like blow my mind. I'm like, what is he doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of yeah. Modest Mouse has a very early album to um sad sappy sucker which is similar like it's weird like you're not like blown away and it's not good but it's just kind of like you're i i still listen to it sometimes because i'm like wow it's so odd like some of the songs they do and some of the choices they make and it's like well it's people like figuring music out and figuring you know yeah what they want to sound like i did see a machine pop up on some i don't know shop or you ever look into the Euro rack equipment that you can get to make your own analog synthesizers? Oh like you yeah. Get these like PCB cards that stick yeah. into a rack and they're slotted and you have to like cable everything over yeah. and turn knobs and that's an instrument somehow. <laughs> it's like the original synthesizer. Yeah. So th- someone had like the original handmade Aphex twin circuit and they had like made a replica of Aphex Twin's own homemade, handmade electronic circuit that oh he was making God. to make music in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> so he that. was like an electronics... <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I'll play with his weird toys and make music that doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. <laughs> My ultimate goal. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. So that's uh, To but The Sky. I, I do appreciate the feedback on that. I love that. That's That's, uh, I mean... Yeah, it's a complex song. There's yeah. a lot going on in it. That's a compliment. Thank you. I, I like that. <laughs> I mean, I would love. I would love to put more of the quirky stuff in the film, and I did try. It just, you know, the yeah. emotion didn't fit. But the music would have been great. Yeah, can, yeah. There's some other bands like um, one guy just came out of the woodwork. Anthony Mathenia. Did you ever meet him? Um, he was on St. So. Louis. I don't. He think was so. at one of the. Him and his wife played at the October Ridge. Oh, okay, but. He's been like hermiting in Arkansas for a long time after doing a lot of creative stuff far after leaving the religion. But I tried to put some of his band six after two stuff in also very kind of, it was just didn't fit emotionally, but it was cool stuff and quirky. Yeah. Yeah. He's actually just told me he's going to try to do like a reboot. So he's like working on rebooting that exact project inspired by watching witness on the ground. Oh shit. That's awesome. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to see what happens. There. Yeah, hearing all my friends' music again definitely. When I saw the movie for the first time, did the same thing to me. It made me want to like get back to recording music and like, oh, why did we ever stop doing that? Like, you know, oh, we just got busy right. and we just don't do it anymore. But you know, or as much anyway. So yeah. <laughs> when you were saying when you were in Ecuador and you played like every day for yeah. hours, yeah. like I had the same thing as a teenager. Somehow that outlet made sense and everyone was cool with it. And mm-hmm. I loved it. Like I mm-hmm. dove into it and I would play for an hour or two a day. And I felt great. It was like, it's like being, it's like an act of being present, which is so mentally healthy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. There's nothing quite like it. I'm having dreams recently this week, even like I'm playing, I'm trying to play a song and record it, but there's like some heavy equipment moving all the time. You can all this noise. <laughs> like, but it turns out I woke up and there's like a, 
huge backhoe next door out the window <laughs> crashing into cement for hours. But like, I'm still just trying to play guitar. So like I, yeah. my, my internal world like wants me to play music. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. I know the feeling. <laughs> and who would you say like were your influences on some of this music? Uh, and I want to get into your newer stuff too, because you have a Spotify album out. Yeah. But this early stuff, who would you say like was key for you? You um, mentioned yeah. Modest Mouse. But. Modest Mouse, like uh, there are earlier songs that like I, I tried to like write lyrics the way he did and things like that. Um, uh, Sigur Rose was like huge for me. So like I wanted something to be like, like I, it was like more okay to be emotional with music and stuff like that. And I, I want it to be that way. Um, Obviously, like a little bit of Aphex Twin and like electronica music, kind of. Um, I, I was good at using like Fruity Loops and stuff like that. So of course, like that's how you, we would create the music to begin, and then you try to like make a band song out of it. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I loved like you know, Elliot Smith was huge for me for sure. Um, yeah, and that's Brad on my and list. And I was like, President has like strong Elliot Smith vibes. <laughs> is my like little note for it. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> If I had to say anybody has influenced me any more than Kurt Cobain, it might be Elliot Smith. And other than that, I mean, it doesn't really come out my music, Kurt Cobain, but to make me interested in music, for sure, Kurt Cobain. But yeah, um, yeah. Pinback, I was super into Pinback for, well, I still am. But um, I, I, there were some songs I think on the album on Spotify, the Go Die one, that I think I'm doing two bass guitars, so similar to what Pinback does. Um, for a lot of their songs, but yeah. Cool. How about Bright Eyes? Oh, definitely. <laughs> One of my first actual light concerts I ever went to was Bright Eyes and M Ward and Jim James did that whole thing and it was amazing. But I have for yeah. the lake where the weak swim, the, I had some Bright Eyes <laughs> vibes to it. Yeah, that's probably about right. <laughs> With President, I wrote there's a stark instrument, but it's like, what is that instrument you're playing on that? Do you remember that track? Oh, I had a, um, somebody in the hall, um, let my roommate Clint Rowan, I don't know if you know Clint, um, let him borrow their banjo. So um, it's a banjo. It's a banjo. Yeah. I've never heard a banjo played quite like that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's cool. I like it a lot. I had like, um, my whole idea with president was it was, it's actually about President William Hen um, William Harrison. I think that's the right one. There's two Harrisons. It's one of the Harrisons. Um, and it's about him because I grew up on Harrison Street in Colorado. And so I thought, oh, it'd be kind of fun to like mask a feeling of growing up behind um, his actual life. Like it would talk about him in a log cabin drinking all alone and, and that he died you know, from pneumonia. So water in his heart and his lungs. And so it's like about him, but it's also about like growing up and like, um, yeah. But I, I thought like, this would be a great idea. I should go through like all the streets whose president's names I've lived on and just do each one and just do like president number two. And, you know, like <laughs> just kind of so, go through them. <laughs> there's a musician who, who had a, a goal of making an album for every state in America. Sufian Stevens. And, Sufian Stevens, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like an inspired by Sufian Stevens kind of It probably thing. is a little bit, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, I love Sufian Stevens. Yeah. I just found, like, I was writing a lot about um, the same things, and I was like, I need to get myself out of that and just, like, and not just write about being sad or being hung up on a girl. You, you like, want to, like, have a topic, and so, like, creating a topic okay. for yourself is, like, so inspiring to, like, mm -hmm. give yourself, like, material that's already there to work with and that you don't have to like make it out of your feelings and stuff. <laughs> that's yeah. That's really interesting. So it kind of creates a, a mask where you can be a different character. Yeah. You're not you representing your emotions. You're this other character and that other character can have their own emotions. Exactly. And it's not, really it's not me feeling that way. It's him. The president, <laughs> the drunk president in the cabin. He felt that way for sure. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> do you think there's anything there that was you sort of wanted to be distant from it in case because people are watching you in the religion like mm. 
getting too close to you, like, oh, you get this guy's making music. Does he have some mental health issues or is he too <laughs> emotional for us? We right. need to get rid of him. Is there any of that, do you think? Or is it maybe your subconscious being affected by that? Or is that just way off base? Um, there was, I was definitely very conscious of what I was writing because I knew there was a possibility that, you know, it would be played for other witness friends and other witnesses that I didn't know. And so there was definitely, um, uh, I remember asking Eric one time about one of my songs. I don't remember which one, but I think I say, um, hell in it, but I'm not saying like going to hell or anything like that. Or like, um, I think what I say is like, she's going home to a coffin in hell. And I asked Eric, I said, do you think that that's inappropriate for like a witness song? And he said, and he was like full on leaving at that point. <laughs> and I guess I didn't really realize, but he was like, that there's nothing wrong with just using the word. It's not like you're, you know, subscribing to the idea of this being some place that people actually go. And it's like, you know, I just remember like feeling really subconscious or self-conscious of what other witnesses were going to think of my music. So I definitely was masking a lot of things in that for sure. Did you ever code any of your lyrics, you think, to like hide the ideas you wanted to express from active witnesses who would be looking in? Not that you were trying not to be a witness, but like trying to code it so that they wouldn't peek their spidey senses about you having your own ideas. <laughs> yeah, I think so, because that album, Go Die, I was still witness for another year. Oh. Um, so I oh, was. I just saw it on Spotify, like last year or two years ago you put it up it doesn't let me date it so that one was oh, okay. 2005 i think and then 2006 okay. i just put up a new one um a couple weeks ago um called your old bones that one's from 2006 so that was when i was living in minneapolis um which would have been around the time that i actually met you and like yeah. hanging out with ross that's actually when i was living with ross um so um, you might have taken over my spot were you living off Lake Street on like? No, I was living on the. Or something. Nope, I was on the okay. Colfax house. So. Okay. Colfax and Twenty Sixth. Um, but I remember that place. Oh, yeah. I remember that place. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, we partied there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so I think you came into my life kind of near the end of my time in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. like late two thousand five mm -hmm. or mid two thousand five. That something. sounds right. Yeah. Because I left like January first, two thousand six. Like I wasn't there that year. Yep. Yep. on my adventures. <laughs> I, so that year, I was still in St. Paul, but that's when Eric started bringing me up to Minneapolis or over to Minneapolis and would just be like, got to hang out with these people. And he's like, have you ever heard of the CC Club? And I'd be like, no. <laughs> and now I have. Let's rage. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. I love it. That's where he wants to take you. Yep. <laughs> that was definitely like Eric's kind of ramp up to like his true potential. Yeah, 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 for <laughs> at sure. At that point. <laughs> well, and he was just like, do you want to like go to the CC club and you want to talk to some interesting people? And I was like, sure. And so you started mingling with people like Ross and then like Ross was living with you at the time. And you start like seeing all these people with like the ability to have a conversation about deeper things. And, uh, yeah. you know, it started to become like, it was my second awakening of like, you know, you see music and you understand and you're like, wow, this is like amazing. But then to like have people who could have a deep conversation are willing to be like skeptical about a thought and like debate it. Like that was fun. Mm -hmm. Like that was like a new thing for me too. So yeah. Yeah. I love that. I thought that community that I had found in Minneapolis, although there was moments where people were like, okay, that's going too far. Yeah. They were still like, I'll see you next week. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. smash one more glass bottle because they're we just got all of our frustrations out in yeah. the rage room and then like, all right, we'll see you at book study and then we'll do this drinking thing after and talk about our true beliefs again. Yeah, yeah. And we do that for like a, a year, you know. <laughs> it's like that community of people was like pretty open minded, even though they had their own personal like, mm. okay, some things are going too far, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I still love you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually it's like you've gone too far in like your first time you've had a free thought. Right. And like, they're like, I'm never talking to you again. I'm reporting you to the elders. These guys were like, you can say anything you want and I'll keep all of your secrets. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as you don't throw up at the party, it's not considered drunk. That's what somebody <laughs> told me. They're like, it's, you're not drunk unless you throw up. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> we're all like, <laughs> 
purple drank. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we got any more Carlo Rossi? I need my wine by the gallon. <laughs> Dude, actually, it's so funny. No. Because I'm in Mexico now in Playa del Carmen. And yeah. I was, and I've been like frequenting the wine section. And there's nothing that special or even that good of a deal. But there's like a section that was like little bottles of Carlo Rossi. And I took a picture to send to Eric and Ross. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to send that yet, but it's so funny. I was like, just a week ago. It's like the opposite like, of what makes Carlo good. It's like a little bottle, but not a big one. <laughs> right. <laughs> like it's about quantity, not quality, friends. Exactly. <laughs> the more sugar. Those things have so much sugar. Like that was the hangover nightmare of that era. Yeah. <laughs> Although we were young enough then. I feel like uh, we'd be worse off now. So luckily we got that wine thing out of the way while we were still young yeah. and, you know... <laughs> I don't even know if that's technically wine. It's burgundy. Yeah. <laughs> Grape drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this Go Die album, and then you did the Your Old Bones, 2005, 2006. Yeah. Have you made anything since those two albums? I have. Actually, the first year we moved to Seattle, um, mm. we did, uh, what was that called? I'm going to remember RPM. it later. RPM. Thank you. RPM challenge. Yes, we did the RPM challenge. It's a really cool thing. Yeah. So we got out there and it was like the first couple months we were there and we're like, oh, let's do the RPM challenge. So like as a whole house, because Eric and Cindy were there too and Danny and okay. Tasha. Um, oh, wow. We all decided. I didn't realize all of you were out there at the same time. Yep. Yep. We all went so out. So that was like your just had exited the religion, like kind of bubble period, right? Yeah. Like the transition time. Yeah. I'd been like, I'd been out, out for like a year probably yeah. and then when we moved to Seattle it was like okay we just need to get away from it all um, so so we recorded I recorded an album and Tasha does um, she plays harmonica in one of the songs and so it was kind of like a, an attempt to make sure everybody was doing something and then Eric and Cindy recorded an album too and so that that's kind of like the last recorded stuff that I have um, I did a little bit of stuff while we were in Seattle uh, later on but um, yeah, but it was a pretty fun first year there. Like everybody was kind of like adjusting to just like being invisible as opposed to like living in uptown where you felt like people knew you and people could see you. And, you know, it was uh, interesting terminology to feel invisible or be invisible. Yeah. You said be invisible. Like just simply were you saying that simply because like you didn't know everyone in the neighborhood yeah or you didn't have witnesses who are watching it or like that kind of influence of people watching um yeah just not just knowing that like I didn't know where the nearest hall was uh kingdom hall was I didn't know any Jehovah's Witnesses in the area they didn't know me and like I just felt like for the first time, like I could walk down the street and I didn't have to explain any of that to anybody. Um, getting a job, I don't have to explain to people like my, um, my needs for like having, making sure that I'm off Tuesday and Thursday nights and Sundays I can't work. And you know, Saturdays probably don't work either. And you know, you know, stuff like that, that you just kind of got used to doing and to finally like go somewhere where I could just like, I'll, I'm going to do whatever I want. And, um, Nobody has to know who I am, kind of a thing. Um, Eric had this like, um, and I won't say what was said because it was like kind of offensive. But like, one of our friends, when Eric was first leaving, drove by him and screamed obscenities out the window at him because he had like left being a witness, basically, and like, you know, mm -hmm. and he was a witness. This kid that had yelled that stuff, but he was just trying to be wow. funny. But, like, can you imagine just, like, I'm walking down Lindale and, like, you know, somebody's just yelling at me. Um, it's weird. Like, it brings you to a place where you're like, well, we don't really belong here. We should probably go. And mm. um, we needed that yeah. exit for a while. So It's interesting. Side topic. We don't have to get into it. But Jehovah's Witnesses were tried in a criminal court for, for being a hate group in Europe mm -hmm. or in Belgium. Mm -hmm. And it's usually hate groups are like a culture or a race and it's really obvious like this group doesn't like that group because their skin color or this group doesn't like that group because you know they're foreign of some kind or whatever culture is different yeah 
And Joseph Witnesses create their own hate group, right? So like if you leave the religion, you're all of a sudden in that hate group and then they do these kinds of ugly things. But I mean, like shouting obscenities is kind of rare, actually. Yeah. But I have seen things like yeah. that. I've seen like actual threats, life threats and rape threats online from witness, active Jehovah's Witnesses towards people who are out. Um, that was really scary to see. And then that was like right in Minneapolis because of this movie, actually, wow. towards someone in the movie. Wow. Um, and then I, the, the worst thing is like the shunning, like the emotional abuse, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They really just want you to disappear. And I feel like there's some deeper human psychology going on. Like mm-hmm. maybe there's multiple things that would be worth diving into from with like a psychologist on, on hand. Like, yeah. What was this about? <laughs> there's yeah. this crazy moment. But I, um, yeah, I get the idea of moving to a new place. I actually give yeah. that recommendation to people a lot. Cause it's like, yeah. Just there's a lot of things going on. It's very complex, and it's like a lot of emotions, and there's a lot of different human beings that could be involved. So like, just going to a new city, like, frees you mm-hmm. immediately. Mm-hmm. And like, the idea of being invisible sounds kind of like a negative thing to most people, but it sounds like for what you're describing is like a feeling of freedom. Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. Um, in the same vein of kind of what you were saying, the very last meeting that I ever went to, um, the presiding overseer came up to me and his brother and I were very close, but I hadn't seen his brother in a, a year and a half or something like that. And he came up to me and he started talking about, um, basically just saying like, Hey, we, we both love this person. We both care about this person. And I don't understand why you are doing the things that you're doing. And I was like, I don't, I, wh- are you, what are you talking about? And he's like, supplying secular material and all this stuff. And I'm like, are we talking about Matt? And he was like, no, I'm talking about Eric, which Eric Elvendahl and Eric's his cousin. And it was this really weird situation where he had his fist like clenched, like he was going to hit me. And he was like the presiding overseer. And we were at the very front of the hall to the point where when I left, some of my friends asked him or asked me like, what's going on right now? Cause this guy's like, I need you to stop giving secular material to my friend. And I said, I'm not give, I haven't given Eric anything. I don't even know what you're talking about. And he's like, no, you do. You, you know, and it just went on and on. And he's like, raising, you know, what are you talking about? No, no. When I talked to Eric, Eric's like, what is he talking about? He's like, if anything, I'm supplying you with the secular material. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) you know, um, it was the weirdest thing ever. Like I felt like he was going to physically start hitting me. Cause he was just leaning into me with his fists and I, and I'm wow. like, you're the, you're the presiding overseer. Like you are like, I don't understand, um, where it was coming from. And I basically got into the car and I was like, I'm never going back there ever again. And that was my very last meeting. Cause you know, I, I prayed a lot and tried to like, be like, okay, I'm going to try to do this. Give this one more go. I'm going to be super honest about it. I'm going to go in service. I'm going to do all this stuff. And then to go in there and like be like, there's no fucking way Jehovah could hear me say those prayers. And if he did, he would have told these people to be gentle with me and like, I'm trying and you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like that's the shit that goes through your head. And then of course, then yeah, yeah you want to fucking disappear because you don't want to be that, that to be part of your life every day. I think like if they weren't such a strictly pacifist organization, mm-hmm. Well, maybe not strictly pacifist, mostly pacifist. <laughs> the average human standard thing that would happen would be the leader of the pack, which is that guy plus his like equal cohorts <laughs> and the elders level, um, would be violent. And it sounds like he wanted to, he almost probably had all the emotions to threaten violence, yeah. but he had to hold himself back, leaving the clenched fist part of the story. Like the way he's holding his body was giving you totally different language than what he's telling you yep. like you're giving him encyclopedia links <laughs> on the internet like stop doing that or you're gonna i'm gonna beat you but he doesn't, can't say i'm gonna beat you but he's like showing you that he wants to yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah wow yeah so much to dissect <laughs> yeah so it was like nine months later we moved to seattle all right uh, no it was a full year because i wasn't actually in minneapolis yet but yeah it was a full year and then we were in seattle and so yeah. Would you say those like 2005, six, seven albums were like transitioning to 
for you personally? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like the first one was more just experimenting and and trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and definitely the middle one, Go Die, was like I was, you know, struggling with a lot of things. Like there's a song on there called Tuesday Night, and it's like literally about meetings <laughs> and you know like i'm just like struggling with like the idea that i don't want to do it anymore and um um and then your old bones was like i was basically done then and then uh and then the final one is i think it's called i am tyrant i haven't released that one yet but um that one's like yeah i was definitely full out um but and in seattle so yeah and I feel like um, Tasha, the first couple of years after we moved to Seattle, she was like, you don't really play that much music anymore. And I felt like in some ways I didn't really have a lot to play or talk about like I used to. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of things that were making me upset or that were like triggering to like really like want to write a song that I would want to hear. Yes. Um, and I had less of that. So, And now it's like, maybe a new inspiration to like write music because it's good for me and um Mm -hmm. so hopefully i'll follow through with that i've been playing around a little bit but how do you feel like it's good for you uh i think you experience i think you just kind of like i think kind of like what you said about like you feel like very present and like um it's something you're in control of too to a certain degree um there's there's a lot of things in life that aren't that way and so to be able to have something that you like i want it to sound like this and i want to and then you play the game where you try to figure out how to make it sound that way and then um i don't know it's good for me it'll it keeps me busy it i i kind of looked at my first couple albums as like diaries because i wanted them to be like um yeah like a diary of like what was going on through that period of time and I can definitely, like, when I listen to those, especially since I put voicemails and stuff like that throughout a lot of my songs, it's like a diary. It's like, you know, my journal <laughs> or something, you That's know, cool. where I like that. I like Very personal. Yeah. And, and I can remember exactly where I was when I would get that voicemail or I could remember what was happening in my life. And, and so I thought maybe I would just keep doing that forever. And then I didn't, but, um, Mostly because people knew that I was going to put their voicemails in my songs, so they stopped leaving them. Stop you. <laughs> yeah, they stopped calling me altogether. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I hope to do more of it um, and maybe find a new way to make it a journal, some some way that's memorable memorable to me. But at the time, that was my way of doing it. So you got to start making parody voicemails from your <laughs> friends with like your own voice acting for their voice. <laughs> oh, it's, this is what Tasha would say if she still left me voicemail. Yeah. <laughs> Chat GPT, come on, man. <laughs> I can have that <laughs> right. just like mimic their voice and just do it for right. me and <laughs> <laughs> hit record. So funny. <laughs> Actually just um, wrote something that was, I have, I have this practice of making a whiteboard list of these are the things I need to do. Here's the ones for priority. Check, put them in order. I'm like, one, two, three, four. Hmm. Go, go sit down at the computer. And then I'm like, what do I really want to do? And I do something that's totally not on the, any of the list. <laughs> it's the day that happened. <laughs> and it's sort of like, well, I know what I need to do. But now I can be free to be free for him or something. Yeah. And this happens to me rarely. And it's sort of like a flow state just happens. And it's like very not productive for my actual goals. But I, I accomplished something I really enjoyed. And it was a blog post about the kind of the same time period we're talking about. Um, you talked about the song Tuesday Night on Go Die. About struggling with meetings. Where in this time period where like we had this free thinking. And uh, it's called like Rage Rage Room Revelation Lies or something. It's my blog post. <laughs> it's awesome. And I like <laughs> to highlight. Um, it's actually like a piece I'm really proud of. I'm gonna make a podcast like just me talking cool. of just reading this because it was like written in my own voice. And I, I read this to another ex witness artist friend the other day, and she's like, "That'd be a great podcast episode. It's like a it's like an audio book of your life. It's really interesting." It's like, okay, I'll do that. But I also highlighted an artist who I've recently connected with. Um, the Bloody Tuesdays, and I like, absolutely love the interview I did with him, highlighting his music and art. All of his cover art is pulled from the Revelation book. Yeah. And when I was in Minneapolis during that time, we all knew each other, and that with that music scene, we were <laughs> studying the Revelation book for the third time. Now that book's not even available from that religion because it's filled with so much crazy <laughs> shit. <laughs>
I didn't need a bit and shit. So, yeah, man, I will talk to you later. Bye. They're trying to use like a fantasy written by a guy in his 90s yep. who's dying in prison who wrote this insane, in, unintelligible, but <laughs> fantasy chaos. Um, and they're trying to correlate it to like people in these black and white photos from basically an entirely different religion going to meet up with each other in New York in 1918 as being a fulfillment of this guy in prison prophecy <laughs> in Israel. It's like they didn't even know about the United States existence as a continent for another 1400 years. Yeah. Like this guy yeah. did not imagine that these people would go to that building on that day. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> Anyway, so then we would, like, go home and, like, drink way too much wine while talking about what we really believe. We'd, like, go in our church clothes back to my place and then drink <laughs> and then talk with the Bible open. Well, this verse here says this, and I don't agree with what they're saying about 1918 yeah. <laughs> and the founder of this religion <laughs> dying or whatever the thing was. Oh then we'd, God. like, throw our glass bottles down the basement. You probably, I don't know if you ever heard those stories, but, like. It was really fun to write about it because it's such an like a moment of freedom and like what brought us like an interesting reputation in that city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Re the Revelation book is an amazing thing. Uh, our first coffee table when we got to Seattle, we all cut pictures out of the Revelation book and glued them all over this coffee table. And so it was just like <laughs> this collage of the Revelation book, and it was just. Oh, it was just beautiful that, like, me and Tasha carried it for, like, the next three or four years until it finally just kind of fell apart. But it was like, I was like, I feel like we should still keep the top. And it was like, ah, it's just time to go. <laughs> but That's amazing. Yep. There's a woman in Perth, Sarah Riches. She did the f original poster for the film on oh. She does yeah. that with the same literature art. Uh -huh. Makes pumps out incredible stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. But I imagine this table had a picture of the Hydra, the seven-headed <laughs> dragon, being tossed through space into the Earth's water or a fire, like a fire, right? Of course. <laughs> it was definitely a lot of the imagery of, like, sinners getting, like, wiped out, you know, kind of a thing. Because yeah. um, <laughs> we were those sinners at that point, and so it was like, well, oh, yeah. you know. <laughs> we are represented in art. How great is it? Yeah, let's have fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe you could do me a favor. Sure. First time watching Witness Underground, what was your experience? Do you remember? Which so someone who's so close to it? Yeah. Which Which one? The first one or the <laughs> the final the main film? Okay. No. <laughs> Whichever one impressed you. <laughs> no, I, I I loved the fact that you used to send us early copies to like give you feedback and stuff like that. That was yeah. like that was so exciting and like to see you take that feedback and like you would take that. And then the next time we'd see it, I'd be like, Oh my God, like this thing's getting like super, like, like well-rounded. And it's like every time I, I probably saw it like th in three different versions, maybe, mm -hmm. um, uh, to finally see it. Like, I guess like at the Minneapolis show for sure, like in the theater with everybody, you know, my, my in-laws are there. And they're not Jehovah's Witnesses, and they were like, they came because wow. they, they love Cindy and Eric, and, you know, they also had the best time there at the showing. Um, cool. But it was very emotional. Like, um, I, you know, obviously, Ryan's contribution to that is his amazing story, and, um, and how, like, blunt and strong he was able to be with the way he was doing things um and then for what happened with Rhett obviously that was just like you know I was around when that happened you know and I was at Rhett's funeral and you know I was aware of Ryan being there and all those things you know so it's like to see it again and see it like in the emotional way that it was done and also to hear some of the other stuff that I didn't know like about what happened at you know his dad's house and things like that um it was super emotional um and then to be able to like have some of my music in there um, was even more fun for me because like you know I don't show my music to hardly anybody like the Spotify thing that's very new like I don't show it mm -hmm. my music to people and I it feels good to do that because it feels like then the song's finished finally and you can move on to another thing and that's why I finally feel like writing new music um, so to hear it on there I was like this is so exciting 
And now the song is finished. And, you know, I turn to my in-laws because they're like, let us know when when your your music comes on and stuff like that. And so I'd nudge them and they'd be like, oh, okay, okay, okay. And then, like, I was like, it's this part right here where Eric's talking about masturbation. <laughs> and they just laughed <laughs> and they were like... <laughs> And they're just dying. They're like, oh my god, we'll never forget that part. <laughs> um, when I said the music carried the topic emotionally, <laughs> I knew it had to be one of your songs. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sinner. <laughs> yeah. But I loved it. Um, Ta- Tasha also grew up a non-believer, you know, so she doesn't know. You know, she knows what she's been around when it comes to that, but she just, she thought it was great too, you know. It was fun to see the reactions of all the other people there too, you know, Chad's family and things like that. It's amazing. Yeah. So There's something really special to get laughs in a live audience. Because <laughs> how often do you watch a movie in the modern day with a live audience? Usually sure. it's on a couch alone at home or with one person. Yeah. And and to be in a room with over 100 people, it was 100 and something. It was amazing. It was like such a huge showing for that. Yeah. And to like get, get the laughs, get some sniffles, and like, yeah, yeah I was, it's really cool. Did it did it feel complete to you then to see it in that in that way, like in front of a lot of people and like a lot of people you knew too? That was by far the best experience. Mm-hmm. So you got to have the the peak of the film festival <laughs> height of it of the amazingness of it. Yeah, um, to see and people for me showed up out of the woodwork that I didn't expect. People flew in from other states, like seven different states flew in just to watch that film in a room together you know it's like a crazy yeah um coming together of things so well can you imagine too if it wasn't like at the like tail end of the pandemic and had it been like when people weren't really like still staying away like i feel like your turnout would have been like way more because you know i know a few people that couldn't go because of it obviously (laughs) right but yeah yeah, that was, that's a bummer for the whole film festival, actually, because we went to 11 festivals, but only four of them were in person. Oh, yeah. Damn. And it's like, they they accepted less films, weirdly, and the ones that were in person, they didn't really bring in people for ticket with ticket sales because it was the pandemic. So. Yeah. yeah. Was, but in the way, it was kind of cool because, like, the people that I did meet there, like, at Minneapolis, I only got to say hi to, like... 40 people and I get to hang out with like 10 people you know yeah even so it's this huge thing because it's like just so many people yeah and you know so, so much time but like the other festivals you'd have like 15 people but I got to know all of them really well because we like did that and then I supported them at their screening and then we went out for drinks and like mm-hmm. a whole evening with like a small group so it, and you just good in both situations but yeah for sure I, what I guess I'm curious now like I feel good about it. I did have to edit some things of the film for legal reasons. Like, one of the other artists died since making the movie. Oh. So he couldn't get rights to his music. So Ryan wrote some other songs. Just little minor changes, mostly very minor stuff. Hmm. Um, but I, like, I'm so excited that it's like available to watch now for the same reason you just said, like putting your music out. It's sort of like, oh, well, now I've been, I've been like working on this for years. Hmm. And a lot of it's just like, well, marketing and the branding and like the podcast is distracting or like I can't figure out distribution. And like, I've, there's a lot of learning that's been happening. But now that it's like, okay, well, now it's out. I'm not changing anything. Yeah. It's done. People can go watch it. Now I, I can make something else. And I'm still curious what that is. And I'm happy to hear that you're finding closure with some old stuff and ready to make something new. And I feel like there's a lot of buzz in the people that are associated with this circle. There's like new stuff happening. Yeah. And it feels really positive, like yeah. healthy. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of it's been just being able to like revisit some of this stuff, like, you know, again, and yeah. s- remember the way it felt to be involved in all of it. And so, yeah, it's good. It's so fun and rewarding to make art. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. Everyone should do that. <laughs> Get right so on. What do you think? What do you think your theme of your next album is going to be your next single or whatever? Uh, I don't know. I hope it's happier, but um, happy music is very hard to write. I think. I think it's a very genuine. Has to be a very genuine form. You know, it can't be cheesy and it can't be. But I, I want it to be a more positive mood. Um, even though the majority of the mu- musicians that I like are, you know, sad music people. But <laughs> um, who are you influenced by now? 
Man, I don't ever change. I listen to the same stuff. <laughs> Still is Elliot Smith and Bright Eyes. Yeah, Elliot Smith, Bright Eyes. I listen to more TV on the radio than I used to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's just kind of the same stuff, but um, uh, okay. I don't know. We'll see. You know, where are they from, TV on the radio? I don't recall. I just know one of the members was a J-Dub. I think exactly I just heard yeah. that yeah there was this guy who came on one of our screening Q&A's back in May his name's Christopher and his group of I can't remember his last name but it's the band is Caustic out in Denver okay and he's friends with that guy like maybe they grew up together or something he's like yeah one of my friends is ex-witness he's in TV on the radio <laughs> it's like seriously like they're such a well-known band and they're so good yeah I remember knowing that like way back when I was in Minneapolis because um, the room that I was in, I think Ben Grimes or somebody had lived in there previously to me. And so then when I moved in, some of their posters were still there and there was a TV on the radio um, poster and somebody pointing that out when they came over and they're like, oh, one of the guys used to be a Joe's Witness. And I was like, oh, OK, cool. <laughs> but I didn't really listen to him that much at that point. And, now I listen to them a lot more, but um. <laughs> for some reason I always thought that they were actually a Minneapolis band. I, think I know, possibly because maybe because so many people in Minneapolis like talked about it and it just like filtered in or something. Maybe, yeah. I guess I always assumed that too, but I guess I don't know. Um. <laughs> I've heard of them on eighty nine point three, probably so <laughs> one of the best radio stations ever. Yep. I still every once in a while I'll catch myself I'm like I want to listen to the radio. Well, I'm gonna just do it on the internet. <laughs> the one good station. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> To the current. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, new so cult. It's you, a new cult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So of all those sad music you listened to back in the early 2000s, you added TV on the radio. I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Any other genres that you've influenced you since then, or have you kind of stayed in the same zone? Uh, kind of the same zone. I guess, you know, Tasha really introduced me a lot more to Build to Spill. Which I know that's not a very far stretch, but um, you know, there's been bands that she's introduced me to. Um, Neutral Milk Hotel, like, oh yeah. And to, uh, the thing is, is like I knew who they were. Had I ever listened to their music? No, I had not. Um, Until Tasha, way after they, yeah, ended they were then, way yeah. done. <laughs> and then Tasha would just be like, "Oh, you should listen to Neutral Milk Hotel," and I'm like, "Oh, I love this." And Mountain Goats, and you know. Mm -hmm. I listened to that back then too, but not very much, but Tasha is really into that kind of yeah. stuff. So cool. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we'll get some mountain goats ish, neutral milk, neutral milk hotel ish music out of you. There we go. Let's <laughs> go for that. <laughs> I'm curious what characters you will embody for your next album. <laughs> I'll find a new president. <laughs> <laughs> cool. What street are you living on now? Shit. <laughs> Nothing interesting. <laughs> 19th. <laughs> uh, 19th president. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to get into? Kind of have to wrap up soon, but. Um. No, I don't know. I think I'm good. I feel like you covered a lot. I mean, my childhood, my uh, my uh, coming coming out, and uh, <laughs> my music, and all that. So. What's the best place to follow you, and best place to find your music then? Uh, best place is on Spotify. Um, Blue Skies, spelled S-K-Y-S. -S. Um, you might be better off just looking up the album title, Go Die, because Blue Skies brings you, like, you know, ELO and all sorts of other... <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, otherwise, like, I'm on Instagram, but that's about it. I'm on Twitter. Um, Melon Baller and the Infinite Radness, if you ever want to follow. <laughs> <laughs> don't follow that I never post so <laughs> I'm on Instagram okay but, yeah I can send you a and link to that later can you shout out the other podcast you are recently on oh yeah uh, I was also on Danielle Martin's uh, Failure to Thriving podcast um, she is now in California as we were saying earlier so she's um, keeping with her every Wednesday schedule of getting a podcast out and I know she's probably going to be doing more interviews but it's super good. She talks about moments where you felt like you were failing in your life and then how you've kind of turned that around and it's supposed to be inspirational and, you know, uplifting and it does a good job of that. So, yeah. 
I was so surprised to find it. It was like my film poster was tagged or my film uh, account for IG was tagged. And it was a Ryan interview and it was like the second Ryan interview. And I was like, <laughs> what is this? And I looked and I was like, literally everyone who's in my movie, not everyone, almost, like a lot of people. Half people in the movie and then like a lot of people adjacent to the movie and some yeah. people who was on the soundtrack. I was like, there's an entire podcast that's like inspired by Witness Underground, kind of. I'm being, I'm jumping, I'm making a leap here, but. I was She's very, out there stealing I was your so shit. Happy. <laughs> I love it. More people should do that. <laughs> go, go poach these artists. They're amazing. Yeah. Help for them sure. out. Uh, for sure. But yeah, it was fun. I was like, well, I have to listen to that and binge it for a uh, two weeks straight because yeah. I need to catch up. I did not know that she's been doing this for six months. Yeah. Um, and it's really good. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. And I didn't really know her, so I'm happy to support her, and I'm happy she's doing that. Yeah. And I wish I was that regular. Putting out a podcast every week is a lot. Yeah. Need, like a team for that. Yeah. She would come and hang out with she us. Doesn't. She doesn't. She does it by herself. She would come and hang out yeah. with us on like a Sunday and be like. I got to go home because I have to start editing now. So it's done by Wednesday. And then it would be like another interview or she'd do like three interviews on a weekend and then just have three lined up and just edit. And then that way she yeah. could take a little break and like, nice. but yeah, she's, she's doing great. Um, That's cool. She's been keeping also I would, another shout out for that show is Cindy did the vocals and probably oh, yeah. the songwriting. She did for the intro and outro. Yeah. And it's awesome. It's yeah. Like Cindy's this genius at melody and like, getting the lyrics to hit a topic so clearly i love it and knowing her she probably like whipped it up in like you know 30 minutes and she's like oh just do this little thing and because <laughs> that's how she writes uh i've written yeah. songs with her before and it's like she's she's like all right i'm, I'm ready <laughs> <laughs> on that note i the reason that the film exists probably at all is because in 2014 like when would that be eight years after leaving the religion and being disconnected from this community, I randomly hit up Eric and Cindy and I was like, I'm involved in a 40 hour film project in Vietnam <laughs> and we need a soundtrack and you're the only people I know who can possibly <laughs> pull that off. And like 12 hours later, they're like knocked out of the park, two amazing songs that blew our minds to the point that I like, I re-edited that film to be like nice. Cause it has like, their music is so good in it <laughs> and it's perfect. And, and then after that, I was like, do you guys, I have this other thing I'm going to do. Do you guys want to like, can I use some of your music for the soundtrack? And that created the XW coming out series in, yep. with all their music. Yep. And then it became this thing. So like they were easy to work with and fun and their music's amazing. So I'm happy shit is still happening. Yeah. And that community sure. is still, you know, part of it, big yep. part of it. For sure. <laughs> it has been a pleasure, Valentine, Valjo. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. It's good to catch up. Yeah, it was awesome. All right. Will, everyone follow Valentine on Spotify. Album Go Die by Blue Skies. <laughs> as well as he's got another album coming out, Your Old Bones, and maybe TBD, I Am Tyrant. Maybe. We'll see. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> All right. All right, take care, Valentine. All right, man. See ya. See ya.